for joining us this morning for the CEO conversation about uh, what I think to be one of the most interesting. I, ca I can't pick a favorite panel. I'm not allowed to. I've been hosting many panels at uh, Cybos this week. But I think this is certainly one of the most interesting and one of the most prescient conversations of our time, particularly at Cybos uh, this week, all about the trends towards T plus one. D and it, I love the way they describe this, the impact of one and only one day to settle security. So to discuss this in some rigor, in a relatively short period of time, it has to be said, allow me, if I may, to introduce you to our stellar panel this morning. To my left is Frank Lasala, who is the president, the CEO, and the director of DTCC. Now, he also serves as the president and the chief executive officer of DTCC's principal operating subsidiaries, DTC FI. CC, NSCC, and he joined in June 2022 after a 28-year career at BNY Mellon, where he had several leadership positions, including CEO of the issuer services businesses and a member of the executive committee. So, Frank, morning. Thank you for morning, being with thanks, us. Thanks, Drew. Good to be here. Uh, sitting to uh, Frank's left, your right, uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome to the stage Liva Mustri, who is the chief executive officer of the Euroclear Group. She joined Euroclear in October 2010 as Executive Director and Chief Technology and Services Officer of the group and as an Executive Director of the board. And she has been Chief Executive since January 2017. Prior to Euroclear, she was also a member of the Executive Committee of BNP Paribas Fortis, based in Brussels, where she was responsible for IT operations, property and purchasing. So truly understands the business dynamics inside and out. Good morning. Welcome to the panel. Thank you, Julia. Pleasure. And last but no means least, uh, we are indeed on his home territory because it gives me great pleasure to yes. introduce you to Kevin Sampson, who's the president of CDS at TMX. He has more than 20 years of capital markets experience managing high-performing teams across <coughs> multiple functions and business areas. So that includes sales, business development, operations, customer support, and product development. Most recently, he was president of the equity trading for TMX Group Inc., where he managed the trading business of Canada's premier equity exchanges. Of course, they are the Toronto Stock Exchange, TSX Venture Exchange, and TSX Alpha Exchange. So, Kevin, very warm welcome. Having, thank you for having us in Toronto. Great. Well, very <laughs> welcome for everybody to be here. And thanks very much, Julia. Listen, I can't wait to get into the conversation because there yeah. are so many dynamics at play. So, again, thank you to everybody for joining us. And just to set the tone a little, if I may, um, we're going to be talking talking about as the move to T plus one in major markets becomes ever closer and we are in different stages of engagement. I'm really curious to explore today what are the opportunities on offer? How important is this to the leaders of some of the major securities infrastructures, uh, our panel today? And what are the, some of the greatest concerns and dynamics around the move? And what is that going to do in terms of impacting the operational teams, many of whom are here at Cybos? So let's get, first of all, straight away, if we may, and Lever, I'm going to come to you if you would. Yeah, let's just start with the, the central premise of why does this matter? Well, I think when we are in T plus one, it's going to be come with a lot of advantages for our business. Uh, I would call a few of them. Uh, we will have a shorter time frame in which the trades are pending, uh, which will reduce the counterparty risks for everybody. And with that, uh, we will be in a possibility probably to reduce margin requirements, mm -hmm. which will then free up space for all market actors to have better capital deployment, to have more transactions, and to have more business for the same uh, resources put in. I would say in Europe, uh, our CSD regulation has been focusing already since quite a while on everything that is related to settlement efficiency. It has introduced penalties around it. And clearly, when we get into T plus one, that settlement efficiency will even need to be much more there in order to achieve uh, the goals. And it will certainly help. But what I would caution very much as of the offset of this discussion, and it will be the topic uh, that we will be discussing later on, I think it would be absolutely wrong to see this T plus one challenge objective as something that is simply to be mandated to the CSDs. Because this is much more impactful. And we really have to take a holistic look to the challenge. And I believe that it will be for some product lines, for some clients, for some business models to be rethinking 
uh, will be required in the context of that T plus one. And this holistic view, from the European perspective, I must say, I think the awareness is still a bit low mm. and we really have to work on that. Yeah. And I think the, the big things that sort of come out of those remarks is this concept of having space to do more, recognition that it's not the responsibility of one market participant, the CSD, but also then thinking about the, the, some of the dynamics and the opportunities that will flow from that. Well, Kevin, can, can I bring you in here? Because yeah. I, I would love to get your thoughts. I mentioned in the introduction about you know, your wealth of experience and your interactions with counterparties and also intermediaries as well. You know, wh when we talk about why this matters, what will this mean to your, your customers and your counterparties? Yeah, I, I, uh, something to pick up on, on what Leva said is around, um, and, and this is pretty well understood, and I think it's table stakes, but it's, it, it's, it's an important point around automation, right? This is an opportunity and a catalyst. Um, that often many of us need across all counterparties in the, in the ecosystem um, to look at process redesign, the modernization of, of workflows. Um, it's an opportunity to look and assess um, new technologies and new tools and solutions because that's, that's necessary. I mean, the biggest impact and the obvious one is the time pressure that the acceleration of the settlement um, uh, cycle brings to all parties across the industry, whether it's custodians, brokers, tra on the trade execution side, and this does touch end-to-end -end workflows, mm -hmm. right? Like thinking that this is just a settlement issue is uh, um, is definitely short-sighted and falls short of, of what's required from, from an assessment perspective. So you have middle office impacts, you have front office impacts, um, you have settlement, you have corporate actions, you have mm -hmm. Uh, fails management, uh, you have funding, you have collateral management. It touches all of those workflows. So although you could characterize it as one of the biggest challenges, obviously, and the obvious one of, of T plus one is that, that need for automation um, and redesign of workflows, uh, it's also the, the, the biggest, I think, opportunity as well as the benefit. Mm -hmm. like at the end of the day, this should result um, in reduced operational risk, not increased operational yeah. risk yeah. through that automation, the rethinking, the design. So I think it's an on, incumbent on you know, every player in the ecosystem to be able to, to, to take that approach um, and, and build more resilience and harden um, their end-to-end -end automation. And, and I didn't want to wait a, s a single second at the beginning to explain mm. who on earth I am. But uh, one thing I would mention is that uh, in addition to, to being an entrepreneur and running a company, I host a lot of conferences. The reason why I mention <coughs> this is because whether it's in the world of trading or in custody or operations, the conversation about automation is, is widespread. I mean, this is probably the starting premise of every discussion uh, on, on, the, on the opening remarks. So the fact that it actually flows end to end and this quest, this common quest, but with an accelerating factor of a ticking clock, if you might say that, sure. the T plus one ambition. But you know, but let, let's, let's tackle this question about why it matters from a slightly different angle. So I'm a regular person on the street. Why should I care? Right. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. There is a there is a cohort that is taking all of this for granted and just assumes we'll take care of it, which mm. I don't know how I feel about that. It might be good. It may not be good. But let me, let me try to answer that question, but from, from our perspective, you know, market participants' perspective. The, the way I think about it is, is this. When you reduce latency, you reduce friction, and therefore you reduce risk, and ultimately you should reduce cost. Yeah. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, but that should ultimately get to the end investor, whether it's a retail or an institutional investor. But when you look at, at really the, the settlement pipeline risk that exists, we're now going to shrink that to one day. So, so what does it mean? We've touched on it when she started. One is, if there is a credit risk event, we will be able to deal with it much more quickly and there'll be less securities to deal with because you've only got one day of settlement pipeline risk going on as opposed to two. That's a big deal. It's a big deal because it reduces overall risk to the system, which I, whether you're a market participant or you're an investor, that's a good thing. You're, you really can't you know, argue with that. I think the other thing that it does is getting back to this idea of ultimately risk or reducing reducing risk and ultimately reducing cost. At, at DTC, when we look at our clearing fund, particularly NSCC, 
um, on a normal day, now no, no day is really normal, but <laughs> on a normal day, our clearing fund is roughly $13 billion. Now I would say to you over the past couple of months, market volatility has been a lot lower, so it's been running at about 10 billion. When we go from T2 to T1, we estimate that we will free up between three and a half to four billion dollars of funds out of that clearing fund. That's going to go back to the market. It's going to go back to the participants, not to the end investor, but to the market participants. And as, as we've touched on, that is going to help in, in terms of liquidity. Mm. And don't forget, we're back, we're back to a, what I think of as a normal in, uh, normalized interest rate environment. Cash matters now. We're not getting paid zero for cash anymore. But more importantly, it's going to provide relief in terms of balance sheet for our member firms. So if you really think through it, this should help reduce systemic risk a little bit because of what I said. Shorter settlement pipeline risk, less securities, easier to manage in a counterparty issue, and we're returning liquidity back to the market. Mm -hmm. Those things add up and ultimately should be reflected in lower costs for investors. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how it would manifest itself, but generally that's the way it should work. Yeah. And, and that absolutely sort of returns to Lever's opening remarks about creating space and opportunity there. So let's just take a moment just to look at the map of the world. And we thought it might be useful for the audience actually to, to uh, and our friends at Cyvos and Swift very kindly pulled together a map. But if we could perhaps call that up on screen. Uh, I find this enormously helpful, by the way. So you might want to grab a picture of it. I've got it. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite pictures in my phone. That's how much I care about this. <laughs> but let, let's just look at the, the, the industry. Let's look at the world and let's look at the different states of readiness. And as we know, you know, India has moved to T plus one and, and moved there, you know, uh, certainly last year. Different stages of conversation, readiness, adoption, change, etc. I suppose my, my, my question, and, and I'm just going to open this up, whoever would like to take it, is when you look at that map, is what gives you cause for optimism? And then we'll come to what gives you cause for concern. So who would like to take the optimistic <laughs> question? Who's the optimist? You're all, I, I, they're all optimists, I have to say, having spent some time with the pleasure of the time with you. But uh, who'd like to talk about what gives you cause for optimism? Well, let, yeah, I'm happy to step in. I, I mean, just let's contextualize this a little bit first, right? And we all know US, Canada is moving in, in May. Uh, India is already there. There's various stages, as the map indicated, in terms of readiness and maturity around the thinking around around t plus one and i think it's also important that we need to look at this through two different dimensions one is through the dimension of uh, north america moving to t plus one in the state of uh readiness and awareness and acknowledgement um for that transition because even though it's 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 north american centric it has global impacts mm -hmm. um uh, which i think we'll, we'll talk a little, a little bit more so there's it's through that lens the second lens is the state of readiness or willingness to transition to T1 in the local jurisdictions as we see on the map. And those are two, two very different things. And certainly I think um, as it illustrates um, the, uh, the immediacy uh, that, 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 that is required at this point is with the May date and transition of, 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 uh, mm -hmm. of T plus one North America. And you know, what, are, what is the APAC region? What's the European region? Um, how are they adapting to that? How are they having the conversations with their clients and their counterparties for the challenges that that's going to provide outside of North America mm -hmm. for those that are accessing and investing in the, in the North, uh, North American markets? Um, and, and I think uh, if we look at what that state of readiness looks like, um, there was some great work done by, by Barney at the Value Exchange um, in collaboration with DTC and, and CDS around polling readiness. Um, and no surprise, in North America, I think it's somewhere around 85 to 90% of market participants are very far advanced. But as, certainly as you move east, not surprisingly, if you get into APAC, it's 25%. Mm -hmm. Only 25% of institutions have, have even started any planning or acknowledgement around what the impacts of T plus one is going to be in North America. That's concerning yeah. um, because we're eight months away uh, and those global investors that are accessing the North American markets 
uh, and their 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 intermediaries are 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 impacted. And yeah. So I think there's some more more work to do there for sure. And I think it's it's our role as CSDs, but also the broader industry and ecosystem role to have those conversations with those entities and those other jurisdictions to raise that awareness, raise that acknowledgement, yeah. um, and to look for solutions around, yeah. you know, FX on funding. Um, right. And, and that, that was, you know, in my, so my opening remarks about, you know, why, why I think this is one of the most important subjects and one of the most important subjects here at Cybos is yeah. because that is the moment where the industry mm. comes together to ha have those conversations. I have, a, I have a strong feeling you were keen to come in here. I, so do, I did, do. I did. So I was, I was waiting, because I, what Kevin said is absolutely right. So, so I have a theory and, um, People could disagree with it. So I'm, a, I'm a, in, in a prior life, I was an arbitrage trader. So I'm a recovering trader. I can't sort of get it out of my head. <laughs> but when we were looking at this map, right, I was just fast forwarding and saying, what happens in a world where everybody is T1? Now, you know, as Kevin said, look, this is, this is going to take time. You know, US, Canada, and Mexico will go in May, which is great, but that's just the first step in what'll be a long, long journey that we'll have to see how it plays out. But, but just think about this. We're in a T1 world. Everybody's in T1. That means you're gonna have, in theory, less, less friction around payments and overnight payments, potentially less friction about delayed, delays in settlement because you have different settlement regimes, T2, T3, T5, T1, T0. I absolutely think that work should be done in terms of how that will be reflected in price improvement for the end investor if everybody is in a T1 environment because everybody's in the same place, payments are moving at the same time, and the world is just in more in sync. And I know Euroclear has done a little bit of good work on this uh, it, with, with some asset managers in the past. And I, I'm pretty, I've convinced myself that there, I wouldn't be surprised that if the world went to T1, we would see uh, price discovery improve and we'd see tightening of bid and offer spreads, which is only good for the end investor, whether it's institutional or retail, because we will be, there'll be a lot more uh, efficiencies in the system that would come out of that. Well, well, Lever, come on in here. Uh, well, before getting to the utopia <laughs> of Frank, <laughs> I think there are a number of challenges around the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this map is maybe giving us a bit of a too optimistic view. Uh, we love the Mercator world presentation. Mercator was a Belgian, so we love it. <laughs> but I think what matters more in this area is the markets, the market cap, their activity, their sophistication. And I think with all due respect for the markets that have already moved to T plus one, I think we are really living the litmus test with the US moving. Mm -hmm. And um, the concerns that I have from the European perspective is that we will add, before getting to the great period, we will add mismatches. We will add quite a number of mismatches. Uh, we will see that uh, the parties that are today used to have an, a day to cover positions, securities, cash positions, mm -hmm. uh, will not have that day anymore. Uh, we will see a mismatch probably between securities markets and FX markets, which will add to the complexity. Global businesses, if I think about multi-listed equities, they can be in one place, T plus one, the other T plus two. If I think about the depository receipts versus the underlying, mm -hmm. you can have a mismatch. Uh, if I think about the international ETFs, that will have on the one hand part of the, of the securities in a T plus one regime, another in a T plus two, for their funding exercise, for their uh, management of the fund, it will be pretty complicated. And also in the, sh in the borrowing and lending space, uh, all global activity will need to manage this, this peri period of mismatch. So I would caution uh, for these uh, elements, and I would caution for the consequences. And I really think as an ecosystem, we are only at the start of thinking about them and, and, and handling them and changing practices potentially even business models to address those. Yeah. Now, now perhaps those challenges are exactly the incentives 
that will drive quicker adoption of T plus one in other probably, jurisdictions. Probably, probably. Because, yes. you know, although I would suggest maybe that there are solutions for some of those challenges and without its, <clears throat> you know, the pain points that that will bring, as, as you well noted, um, it, it'll be interesting to see that if, if, if those become yeah. impactful and problematic, that will certainly drive quicker adoption to harmonize the settlement cycle around the world. Kevin, I, th I think your point earlier about it forcing the industry to reimagine the way it works and pro is really critical, right? It's, I could see it in the U.S. We're, we're, we're being forced to think about things differently. We're being forced to think about processes in a different way. We're forced to introduce new technology that we otherwise wouldn't have done. Look, we all have priorities, and we have a finite amount of resources to tackle them. This is forcing us to look at processes that really haven't been looked at mm -hmm. for a long time. Yep. And I think it'll also help looking back at the, at the screen, and, and Leif, you're exactly right. It's, it, it, there are challenges there. It's not, it's not as easy as we might think, but there are some markets that I could see with new technology, just a leapfrog, probably leapfrog ahead of the United States in a lot of ways, or maybe Canada, uh, in terms of the way they process. And I think at the end of the day, that's a good thing. It, it'll we'll, we'll have hiccups. We're going to have bumps. It's going to be challenging, but I think long term it'll be po it could be really positive. We can transform the way the industry operates. But but also as we as we look at the map, you know, uh, those markets are there's no homogeneity across the world. I mean, different markets have different dynamics. So for example, we look at India, you know, enormous market, but the, but the market dynamics are very very different from the U.S. or the European markets. Is that, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts thoughts about you know, for the industry itself as we're coming together, but actually as different participants in the industry. What advice would you give the audience to take away to go? This is where you can focus on the opportunity that's out there. Who'd like to go first? Leva, you're, you're nodding. You're, 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 yeah, you started yeah, the opportunity yeah. at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I'm, and I'm fully in agreement there. And I think indeed uh, the the answers are in really thinking about the state, the straight through processing end to end. It is really important that uh, uh, the levels of st straight through can continue to increase in order to be up to the challenge. And, and it may be through totally different technologies. It may be through adjusted business models. We hear that some of the parties will uh, look at bundled services again that were unbundled in the past, just to make sure that it can uh, move fast enough uh, to be compliant with the T plus one. Uh, so this, this, there would be my recommendations. Uh, as Kevin was saying, use this really as an incentive to automate things that have not yet been automated so far. Uh, but I would also really, really uh, motivate people to think very holistically. For instance, we know that there are quite a number of parties that benefit from netting because of the extra day. Right. Right. Uh, those, those approaches, those practices will have to be reviewed in the context of that loss of the full day. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept of moving from... I mean, I've been in the industry sort of 30 years, moving from bundles to unbundles to mm. rebundles, but in different forms is, is really fascinating. Um, Kevin, can I bring you in there? So when we think about some of the operational and some of the sort of functional impacts of the, this, this, I mean, we live in a highly sort of multilateral world. Um, and when we think about the risk management operational processes, do you see some bundling in areas or do you see uh, some areas where actually in specific focus would drive greater efficiency and opportunity. Yeah, and I mean, I can speak in the Canadian context, because I think, as Frank noted, every jurisdiction is a bit different in their market structure and the evolution of their, their processes. And, um, you know, with that compressed settlement cycle, uh, the the challenge, a couple of challenges in Canada that, that's very acute in terms of the buy side challenges, in terms of trade affirmations, um, and getting the trades confirmed, affirmed uh, delivery to the CSD, um, that, that, that now needs to be done in an extremely condensed uh, time frame. And, and I think there are challenges there. There are also solutions. And again, this gets into kind of a bit of what Leave said, that this also provides, you know, those, those, these challenges will be solved by people out there that have solutions and, um, uh, and provide some competitive dynamics to mm -hmm. the market as, mm -hmm. as well as a result of that. Um, so, I mean, DTCC has a great um, solution, their match to instruct. 
um, to help the buy side meet those those T plus one challenges. And you know, it's something certainly we've been working with them in in looking at at adopting in Canada and, and uh, having that integrated with the the, the CSD here. Um, the other thing I think is is uh, it is important to to consider is the liquidity impacts as well, right? And, and I agree with Frank that over the long term, once this stabilizes and when we get to the kind of end state, certainly there's liquidity advantages um, and benefits to the market. But I think in the short term, what's, what's, it, it's, there's going to be liquidity constraints. Mm. Um, and in Canada, we have a couple of things going on. Uh, that really kind of create this perfect storm of, of somewhat pressure yes. uh, on, on the industry. Uh, we have kind of quasi-elevated interest rates, or certainly in the, in the short term uh, that we're living in. We have T plus one coming up in May. Um, we have um, the transition from CEDOR to, to Quora as a reference rate, which has an impact in terms of uh, eliminating a fundi funding source yeah. in, the, in the form of bankers' acceptance in Canada, right? And so there's going to be this increased demand for HQLA in the market that's going to create liquidity needs. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a fails regime, um, which certainly is, is adopted in Europe, and that's coming our way for sure. There's penalties coming into effect in Canada in 2025. So all these things are coming together. Um, where liquidity is going to be a challenge in the short term if these issues are not solved for. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I think people need to, it's not just an operational, which is a big challenge in and of itself in mm -hmm. terms of that, that automation and that end to end of, um, redesign, but uh, it's, it's tackling these things to, um, through the lens of liquidity. And yeah. how do we make sure that from a funding perspective, we can might make the markets continue to have them run run efficiently. Yeah. Well, Frank, can I bring you in here? Because a couple, couple yep. of things I'd love to think about is we think about the liquidity dynamics and you were talking about those, right. that, that potential there. But also in terms of th there will be aspects of that that are common challenges for all. Yeah. And therefore, the role of industry associations and industry discussion. What would your advice be um, about thinking how best the industry can come together? Yeah, I, I think there's a, c a couple of things. Um, the one, the one thing, you know, you asked earlier about what keeps us up at night and what, what are you worried about? And we, there's a lot of, re, there's a lot of things that keep, we, you know, we, we just stay up at night because that's what we do, right? We <laughs> worry, right? We, we're paid for worry. Well, you were a trader. So, <laughs> we, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> but, but here's the conversation that we're having, and I think everybody in this room and all over the world could have, and the industry needs to have, and it's around resiliency. So even though you may not be in a jurisdiction that's thinking about T plus one, or even thinking about thinking about T plus one, as a famous central banker once said, you've got to really think about what your resiliency stack looks like if you want to get to T one. So, so just just think about this. With us, with NSCC, right now, you do a trade at four p.m. on trade date. You've got almost nineteen hours to submit that trade to make out to make our cycle to match net and settle the trade on T two. That 19-hour window is going to shrink to five hours. Imagine if your stack goes down. If it goes down for two hours in a 19-hour window, you might be able to manage it. It goes down two or three hours in a five-hour window, that's a problem. So the one thing that I would suggest we should be talking about as an industry, you could take it back and look at it yourself, is what does my resiliency stack look like? What's my backup plan if something goes bump in the night or bump in the afternoon in a T plus one environment? Mm -hmm. Because inevitably, we're going to have an issue collectively as an industry. And as Lee, Lee and I were at a lunch yesterday, and one of the topics was interconnectedness. We are all interconnected. So no matter who you are out there, if something happens, you're going to have a ripple effect to other counterparties in the industry. So I think that's really one area mm -hmm. where I'm convinced the industry needs to think about what does that playbook look like if a medium, large, maybe even a smaller firm has a problem, mm -hmm. especially in a T1 environment, because the, the recovery window is shrinking quickly mm -hmm. and it's a lot, a lot, a lot shorter. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and maybe if I may add to that, uh, in Europe and in the UK, we should by no means be complacent. It's not because we are not in May 2024 moving to T plus one, that we will not also be, I would say, seeing these ripple effects being in the tail of the shock waves yeah. uh, if things happen in the US. So even if that move for ourselves is further away, even if we can say, well, we will benefit from the learnings that have taken place in North America, and we will be watching that very carefully, and we will want to take those learnings, but yet, even with that, we will have those ripple effects, and we need to prepare for them as well. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether we're going to see the kind of the tectonic plate shift a little in terms of, um, as you say, highly interconnected world, no matter whatever state of adoption, readiness, or indeed consideration. Um, are we going to see some divergence, international divergence? Frank, what are your thoughts on that? You, in terms of just... Uh, Connectivity, or uh, well, uh, either in terms of liquidity move, or in terms yeah. of uh, world, well, let's let's world dominance. Yeah, look, I think there's no doubt when you have these. I think you use the term tectonic shifts or, or seismic shifts. You know, you're gonna you're gonna have those that are gonna move ahead much more quickly, and you're gonna have a gulf. I, I think the world will the world will ca those that fall behind will ultimately catch up. I think it's. It's in everybody's best interest in global capital markets interest for that to happen. I think we have a responsibility, particularly those of us maybe in the United States and North America, Canada, US, Mexico, to help the industry. We teach, we learn from what we the whole exercise and then try to bring everybody along because it, it behooves all of us to, to sort of move in lockstep step as best we can. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, you know, we wanna we wanna make sure that the industry has what good liquidity pools, those li liquidity pools aren't upset or disrupted because of back office or settlement issues. And we wanna ultimately be part of the, the value chain that can provide pr better price discovery and price improvement for investors. Yeah. So that's sort of how I, I think about it. Mm -hmm. um, we, we could all help each other on this. Yeah, but, Kevin, but your it, thoughts? It, uh, just to build on that, I mean, the old saying, right? We're only as strong as our weakest link. And and that really isn't true in a, in a, in a really principle-based, perspective in this where there's always two counterparties to a trade, right? So if half the industry is ready and half the isn't, you're going to have a big issue, yeah. right? Um, and so it, got, it gets back to that collective ecosystem view that we all need to take and not only incumbent on FMIs such as ourselves, but the broader industry that it's, you know, it's easy to get focused and rightfully so on your own internal preparedness. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a broader view to be had because if you have a counterparty that's not prepared, you could have the best automation, end-to-end -end processing, resilience built in, and you're going to get a fail if the other side isn't yeah. isn't prepared, right? So it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that everybody is prepared yeah. um, to, to derive all the benefits that yeah. uh, my colleagues here have outlined. But to take a bit the optimistic view, if you think that Frank, <laughs> uh, that Frank and his teams and Kevin and the teams will do a great job and North America will be in T plus one and they will benefit from all of these advantages that we have been designing here, then in Europe we might have a problem because we already know that our capital markets are much weaker than the US ones. Mm -hmm. If the liquidity has enhanced substantially in the US market, that will not be to the advantage of the European players and of the European banks and of the European capital markets. So on the tectonic plate angle, mm -hmm. that is also an attention point that we will need to have. Yeah, And, and I've been sharing some phenomenal discussions uh, th this week. And also, my mind are, are full of the, the truly global international audience we have here at Cybos. It's, it's only looking at sort of regional developments and regional opportunities. So for example, I've been talking a lot about uh, development in Latin America, but I think also of Africa, you know, I think, and we, you, you touched on it, Kevin, as well, with Southeast Asia. And I'm really curious to get your thoughts about, you know, expectations for some of these other markets. Um, Frank, let me start with you. Well, uh, look, I, I could share with you, last week we had a delegation from uh, Taiwan, the Taiwan Stock Exchange, and the regulators, they came to New York, and they were very, they wanted to talk about T1. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know what the impact was, what they can do to begin to prepare for it, very much like the conversation we're having now. It was around resiliency. Obviously, um, you know, Kevin was very kind to talk about, you know, match to instruct. We're talking about how do you affirm trades, you know, if you're in, in the Far East, 
that there you're a little disadvantaged how do you how do you match those trades up uh, we talked about as i said technology resiliency so the other thing that that was interesting in the conversation is is what are the what are the local regulations that might prevent you from going to t1 or let, let me say it differently a lot of our market regs are constructed around a t2 or a t3 environment Sometimes, and we, we could talk about this if when we talk about T0, the tech, a lot of the technology is here to do this. There's technology for T0 already. Mm -hmm. It's more about market structure and market regulations than it is about the technology. So if you look at rule NMS in the United States, just as an example, you think about locates for shorts. You think about, I think we've talked about it, stock loan, stock power. Those regulations have to be looked at, and I would say some may need to be rewritten for us to even contemplate a T plus zero environment. Mm. So, so there's a whole, there's a whole, you know, the industry is 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 complex. It's multifaceted. Um, it's not just technology. It is regulation. It's market behavior. It's 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 instructions. Um, all of that has to look at holistically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that's the implication for the for the goal for the global market players you've got to look at a lot of things yeah. before you just say i'm going to do t1 or t0 whatever it is it's multifaceted well, well then no, no, please yeah. uh, maybe to add uh, at euroclear we have been developing for many years a product that we call global reach where we really connect emerging markets to the international investor space mm -hmm. and if we if we look at what is so important for these emerging markets it's really that they need that international investor base to fund their yeah. infrastructure products, their in development projects. And so it is clear, and we, we experience it all of the time, that they're very eager for that. And so if they don't adjust to, to, to the new world that is the reality for the international investors, they will simply not be attractive to them. Right. So I'm certain that they will be very eager to follow there and very eager to adjust to what is the, the practice of the international investor world. Yeah, yeah. and of course, all, all these elements need to come into play. But I wonder if I can pick up on one thing you were just talking about there, Kevin, which is, um, uh, forgive me, Frank, um, was this move to T plus zero. Is this a linear journey? People go, oh, okay, well, you know, well, once you've got T plus one down, the next logical step would be to go to T zero. I love, I can't have a panel about this and not ask your opinion on that. Let me start with you, and then I, I'd love to hear other voices. You really want to start with me? <laughs> <laughs> I really want to start with you. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I, I, we get the question all the time, right? right? People are coming to us and say, I mean, we haven't even gotten to T one, and people say, when are we going to T zero? And it's just, it's a natural question, right? It just, it just makes sense. And a lot of what I said before is, is what, what we say, which is, look, first of all, let's get to T1. Let's bed that down. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the prerequisite to even, you know, thinking about T0 is what is your resilient, what does technology resiliency look like? Because then there's really no, there's no room for error. Two, how do we, what does it mean for netting versus gross settlement? Because you've got to ask that question. Do we need netting in a T0 environment? And, and we can have a a debate about it. We can have a conversation. There are people who are going to say we still should do netting. Uh, we talk about end of day T zero settlement versus continuous settlement. So you can you can cut this cake a number of different ways. But but the cover charge to having that conversation is what does the regulatory environment look like? What are the impediments of that regulatory environment to get to T zero? What rules will have to change? And what is the impact? Not so much for infrastructure but for end investors and surveillance and regulation, what does that mean? And the regulators have to be fully engaged on that, fully engaged. And we as an industry probably have to work with them on it, but that's, that's critical. And then ultimately, you, know, you, you can then begin to talk about the technology stack. And like I've, I said a few minutes ago, a lot of the technology is there, right? Um, NASDAQ built a T0 platform for Saudi Arabia, I think it was, and then they had a. I, I think they had to rebuild it to move it to T1. I, I think I'm right on that. Don't, don't hold me to it. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 doable, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the critical path to getting there is much larger. So this is not, in my opinion, a linear thing. No. 
I don't you know, know what? Well, Kevin, please, yeah. It, you, you know, it's a really good point, and just to, to, to drive it home as well. Like the, the technology is there, as you said, Frank, and it is surprising that in the shift to T1, which we're all living right now, that DLT has not been broadly adopted as a solution for all the issues that we've been we've been talking about. And I think it's it's interesting to ask yourself why is that? Because the technology is there. I mean, you walk around Cybos here in the exhibitor hall. I mean, there's you know, pick take your pick. And uh, and I think it's all those other contextual, environmental, ecosystem issues that are that are that are driving that. And I think I do recall in 2017 with the transition to T T plus two, I think it was ri widely recognized that DLT will be required for a move to T plus one. But yet mm -hmm. here we are, and it really hasn't been broadly adopted. Yeah. So I think all the issues that Frank raised is, is 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 partly the reason. But there's no question about it. Moving to T zero is a different kettle of fish altogether, yeah. And, yeah. and certainly technology. And, and those, those kind of regulatory policy dynamics come into play and of course you, and you use the reference uh, or, or the language of surveillance which um, which we don't have time to get into <laughs> surveillance uh, 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 now but it's a fascinating sort of dynamic that, that's also coming in. Uh, the clock is never our friend uh, on panels like this but I do want to just ask you a couple of questions. Um, actually if I could ask you to focus on one thing which really for the benefit of the audience is what are we at risk of overlooking? You could take that in any direction you like, but it's always a good takeaway for the audience, I always feel. Um, Kevin, can I come to you first, your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it was already raised here is about the ecosystem view, right? That, mm. that again, it's not about us and our own institutions, it's about the broader market, right? And how we can ensure that that's functioning. Um, and, and I think it, it also comes down to basically communication as well, right? Like the, the communication with your, your clients especially as a, as, as, a, as a broker, as a custodian, um, is extremely important. Because I think, we touched on it earlier, I think the, the buy side is a, uh, and the institutions are a segment of the market um, that obviously is very critical in, this, in, in the whole value chain. And, and uh, I think more attention is, is mm. needed there. And I think it's, it's our job to communicate, provide solutions. I mean, that's what we do as FMIs and CSD. And I think the market's naturally looking to us to some degree to help provide some of those solutions as well. So there's, there's a huge communicative aspect of it. Thank you. Eva. Uh, so there's one element we have not yet touched a lot upon, and I think it is going to be very important. It's the time zone differences, mm -hmm. because those are fixed. Those are there. Tokyo will remain 13 hours yeah. ahead of New York. And our finance business is global. And in order to be efficient, it has to be global. It even will become more global, and it should become more global. And how... For the moment, we hear that there are parties that are thinking about having night shifts, that think about moving people to the other side of the world in order right. to challenge that, or to manage it. I think those are temporary solutions. I think we really have to integrate still in the thinking that time zone element of global business. And that's where I think the T plus one step is very important mm -hmm. because if we cannot manage in there, then T plus zero is still going to be quite a while away, right. I think. Yeah, thank you for your thoughts on that. And, and Frank, see us after the last kind of minutes with your thoughts about what are we at risk of overlooking? You know, it's, it's, it's always hard, right? I, I would say a um, couple of things. Let me start on a very positive note. I'll give, give folks just a, a little bit of uh, <laughs> inside activity that's going on. So DTCC, we opened up our window for testing back on August 14th. We, 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 want, we wanted nine months of testing going into T1. We actually just took that from the T when we went to T2 because we felt it was good. I would tell you that, you know, we've got like 30 of our biggest members sort of are the, are the majority of activity. They are all actively testing with us now. Uh, the big platforms are testing. Now, we, we don't see everything that we're doing, but we've opened up for testing, and there is a lot of testing going on, and we expect that to keep going. That, that's very positive, because obviously market participants are taking it seriously. They're engaged. The sooner we could pick up on things, the sooner we can smother them, get them dealt with, and, and move on. So, so I think that's, that's all positive. I think... What we, we need to do at some point is, you know, we, we've this conversation's been... Um, it's been very focused on settlements, the implications of what it means.
but there are also broader implications. And I think at some point we need to look at the totality of the impact of T1 on the market. So, so just give you an example. If you're, a, if you're a trading house and you are sending your trades to a clearing firm, um, when do you pre, when, when do you require, when does that firm that's gonna clear require pre-funding, right? In a lot of contracts, it's predicated on a T plus two cycle. That's gonna change. Pre-funding has to happen sooner. Mm -hmm. There's a cost associated with that. What does that mean? So, and, and if you go along the whole chain, right, you'll, f you'll find these, these, these sort of interlocking uh, processes. And I do think we have to take a step back and mm -hmm. at some point mm -hmm. and say, how does it all hang together? And what has been the collective impact of this from beginning of trade life cycle to the end. Yeah, which absolutely builds on uh, Kevin's opening remarks about the, uh, right. the the dynamics of play, the, the quest for automation, the quest for efficiency to reduce risk, to, to open up opportunity. We've also talked about how the industry needs to step up. It's not just a CSD uh, kind of uh, requirement, if you like, or, 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 or indeed a CSD sole opportunity. It's a global dynamic, different states of adoption, readiness, consideration, but also thinking about, Lever, you opened up with your remarks about making space, the opportunities that are on offer, and particularly the liquidity that's going to be available in the marketplace. Mm. I have to say, in, in a really short period of time, mm. I have to say, it's been a very extensive conversation. I hope you've enjoyed as much as we have. We were talking before about, should we bring in audience questions? But we had a very strong sense there was a lot to discuss. Mm. However, I do know very generously you've agreed to sort of take a couple of moments at the side before you get on with your busy days so if anybody does have a question please do ask and i'm sure you'll have your teams with you uh, but please join me in just taking a moment to thank the panel for a phenomenal discussion thank thanks, you thanks, all thanks, very thank much you. Thank, thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.